Today's entire episode is dedicated to John Fahey, an American primitive guitar. We're gonna go through John Fahey's life. I'm gonna be sharing some factoids with you about his artistry, his creativity, even his gear. In fact, we're gonna get a really cool sneak peek on his gear, but we're gonna kick things off with my top 10 American primitive guitarists that are carrying forward John Fahey's legacy. In fact, if your record collection feels neglected, it won't be after today's episode. So let's dig right in to my top 10. Let's start first with Glenn Jones. Glenn Jones is an artist I've featured on Acoustic Tuesday before, and he embodies all things American primitive guitar. The use of alternate tunings, the finger picking, the use of dissonance, and the beautiful simple melodies that just seem to be, well, memorable in my opinion. So Glenn, uh, Glenn Jones, I almost said Glenn Fahey. Glenn Jones actually, from what I read, I believe played with John Fahey on an album. That's not what we're gonna be looking at right now. We're gonna be looking at Glenn Jones' solo career his album, Against Which the Sea Continually Beats. Uh, he has this cool cartoon, cartoon motif on all of his album covers. And the song we're going to be listening to today is The Teething Necklace, written for John Fahey. playing is number one, well, he has this distinct tone and he keeps things simple. Those are the two things, the tone and the simplicity, which I think are two elements of American primitive guitar. Now, also, I should mention that the name of that song, The Teething Necklace, I absolutely love. And the fact that it's for John Fahey, what better artist to kick things off than with Glenn Jones writing a song for John Fahey. Let's move on to artist number nine. And I wanna introduce you to, if you haven't heard of yet, Jack Rose. Jack Rose is an incredible guitar player. One who, again, embodies that American primitive guitar spirit, but kind of takes it in his own direction. And that's one of the beautiful things I like about this particular genre of music. John Fahey really started it all, and he really opened up this whole world for guitar players. But each of the guitarists that I'm gonna feature today kind of take their idea of American primitive guitar and run with it. And I think Jack Rose is a great example of this. And there's a cool, there's a kind of a cool chain of events here. John Fahey played with Glenn Jones. Glenn Jones actually played with Jack Rose. They've done a couple of duo things together. Jack Rose is actually now unfortunately passed on, but his musical legacy lives on. In fact, there's an album you must get and add to your collection right this very second. It's called Kensington Blues, and it is delightful. The art is awesome. The music is awesome. In fact, we're gonna listen to a song off of that album called Cross the North Folk. Here it is. about Jack Rose actually after he passed uh, almost uh, I want to say almost a year ago and it just blew me away digging into his catalog it was just like it was a wow moment you know you, you realize there's some amazing music out there a lot of artists that well you may have never heard of in fact I can guarantee you that on my top 10 list you probably haven't heard of at least two of these artists I'm willing to put money on it because I just discovered them and I discovered them in a place that, well, I never thought I'd find myself. So let's move on down the countdown. Uh, starting, uh, or not starting, moving on to number eight. We're gonna take a bit of a detour in the banjo direction. Yes, a banjo direction. This is not meant to scare you by any means, but a lot of times we associate, well, American primitive guitar with guitar. But you can take that same melodic simplicity, that same dissonance, that same kind of starkness to the banjo and do so in a really effective way. In fact, Nathan Bowles does just that. His album, Nansamond, is probably one of the most beautiful albums of banjo music that I've ever heard. 
it's quiet, it's melodic, it's simple, and it just has wonderful tone and almost, a, there's a sense of urgency when he plays, not in terms of the speed at which he plays, but the note selection and the way that he creates these beautiful melodic passages. It's its really stunning to listen to. His album, Nansamond, has some incredible art. It's a, a kind of a superimposed trees on a river. It's beautiful to look at. It's, it's amazing to listen to as well. In fact, let's listen to the song Chuck a Tuck off of that very album. <laughs> Some discoveries that I made while researching this show where I was like, I there's no way I cannot put him on this list. He He's captivating. In fact, there's a couple of different um, kind of, I'll call them mini documentaries out there uh, about Nathan and his, his playing, his approach is so, it's so awesome. Uh, it's kind of a lame descriptor, but it's true. Uh, it's fascinating and uh, definitely a music and uh, um, you can tell by one of these mini documentaries, he's got just a shelf of records behind him. And his approach to composition, his approach to listening to music is definitely summed up in that beautiful album. Let's move on down the line to our number seven position. And this is another newly discovered artist that, well, I quite frankly didn't know of prior to doing research for the show. But as soon as I saw the album cover of this individual, I was blown away. His name is Rob Noyes. And the album we're gonna to listen to a song off of is called They Told Me the Train Had to Be Endless. It's a beautiful album cover with kind of a line cut drawing of a train. Uh, just gorgeous to look at and again, delightful to listen to. He has this sense of timing and you know, it's ironic that he chose a train for his album cover because that's what I think of when I hear him play. It almost has this momentum that builds up. He does a lot of 12 string stuff. He does a lot of, um, very solid alternate thumb playing. I mean, his technique is is super, super stable when it comes to that timing on the thumb. And I think you'll hear it in this song called Further Off. actually queued up one of his, that very album, uh, while Whitney and I were eating dinner. And when I say that he has this, uh, almost train effect, this momentous effect when he plays, Whitney's like, I'm feeling a little anxious when I listen to this. Uh, we were trying to have a nice relaxing dinner. So, uh, a little disclaimer there. Uh, Rob is very, very kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, traditional American primitive and, his, his performances, his songs are very dynamic. In fact, a, a lot of them reach a crescendo. So maybe not the best dinner music, but a damn fine example of American primitive guitar. And I'm so happy to have found his music. What a delight. And for those of you looking for an album that, that really kind of carries some emotion through dynamics, it's a fine, fine example. I would strongly recommend that very album. Let's move on down the line to number six, our first female on my top 10, not the last though. Uh, I wanna introduce you to Marissa Anderson. I first found out about her on NPR, uh, the Tiny Desk series. I saw her playing. In fact, uh, also I wanna mention Andrew D, a frequent viewer of the Acoustic Tuesday show, mentioned Marissa Anderson to me. And I said, I gotta check her out. We're gonna be digging into her album called Cloud Corner. And I think this particular album, when you look at the cover, it is a perfect example of how her songs make you feel. Very dreamy. They kind of cast this wonderful melodic dream shadow when you when you kind of 
uh, start to think while you're listening to her songs. The note selection, the compositions really offer up this almost fog-like dream state, much like the album cover uh, exhibits here. So let's actually listen to the song Cloud Corner off of her album, Cloud Corner. This is Acoustic Tuesday. This is about the acoustic guitar. Now, Marissa seems to split her time between an arch top and an electric guitar, and I thought, you know what? This is about John Fahey's legacy. This is about American primitive fingerstyle guitar. She, she's in our countdown. She needs to be in our countdown. Uh, in fact, one of the best moments I've had in the last week was putting that very album on and sitting down by my fire, my wood stove, and just listening just simply listening, no other, nothing visual coming in, no TV, no nothing else but listening to that album, sitting by the fire and just soaking it all up. It was, it, it was an awesome experience and one that, well, I hope that you try and replicate uh, because spending time with that album is time very, very well spent. Now I wanna halt the countdown right now because I just wanna ask you, we're going through 10 artists that embody American primitive finger style guitar. And I wanna ask you in the comments below, were there any surprises so far for you? Anybody that you just discovered that you're super excited about? Or did you think, gosh, Tone, you should be adding some other players in your, in your first section of five players here. Let me know in the comments below what you think. New discoveries, somebody I need to discover? Go ahead and place it in the comments below. And if you wanna check out the full list right now, please visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132 and you'll be able to see my list of the top 10 American primitive, primitive fingerstyle guitars that are carrying forward John Fahey's legacy. All right, this week on Acoustic Tuesday, you've already added to your record collection by learning about five of my favorite American primitive fingerstyle guitars, guitarists. Uh, you're also gonna dive into the world of John Fahey. We're gonna go through John Fahey's life and explore 10 twisted facts about John Fahey that I think you'll find entertaining, uh, surprising, and ultimately inspiring, especially as a guitar geek. And then we're gonna wrap up the show with my remaining five guitars that you need to know, two of which that I just discovered that I'm pretty sure you don't know about. So make sure to stay tuned. That's all coming up right after this. I'm Tony Castro, and this is the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Guitar geeks, unite. Welcome to Acoustic Tuesday, episode 132. I can't even believe we're on episode 132. This is the show where you're gonna learn about acoustic guitar gear, discover acoustic artists, and get inspired to live your very best acoustic life. As with all episodes of Acoustic Tuesday, I'm gonna share with you my Guitar Geek list for the week. But before I dig into my John Fahey-inspired Guitar Geek list, I want to ask you a Guitar Geek trivia question. Now this question, since the focus is on John Fahey today, revolves around none other than, well, John Fahey and his business endeavors. John Fahey started the record label Tacoma Records in the year 1959 to release his own music. Tacoma eventually released more than just John's music. What was the first non-Fahey record to be released on this label? Was it A, Leo Kotke's 6 and 12 string guitar, B, Book of White's Mississippi Blues, C, Peter Lang, The Thing at the Nursery Room Window, or D, Mike Aldridge's Dobro album? Go ahead and ponder that, and at the end of the show, I'll not only give you the years of releases, the, the years those albums were released, but also the answer to the trivia question. Now, one of the things that was interesting as I was researching information for today's show was that you know, I've been a John Fahey fan for quite a long time, but I've never really delved in deep. And this show gave me an opportunity to do that. And I thought, you know, there's all these articles and everything goes from birth to death and it's very sequential. And I thought, <clears throat> I don't think we have time because John Fahey, man, he took some detours in his world. Uh, but what I wanted to do was share with you 10 facts that surprised me, or 10 facts that I thought that you guitar geeks would really enjoy. In fact, 
I think when I get to fact number nine, you guitar geeks that love gear are absolutely gonna salivate. But I digress, we have to start at fact number one. And I've entitled this fact, Bit by the Bug. Yes, John Fahey got bit by the guitar bug in 1952. Now remember, he got bit by the bug in 1952. He released his first album in 1959. That's pretty short, it's only seven years. John Fahey got bit by the guitar bug in 1952 after being impressed by guitarist Frank Hovington, whom he met while on a fishing trip. Fahey then purchased his first guitar for $17 from a Sears Roebuck catalog. Now, if you've never heard of Frank Hovington, don't feel bad, I hadn't either, but I had to dig in to hear how John Fahey got inspired, and I found a great song, and here it is. Honey, that was way back, baby. Ooh, in the more sin foggy days. Hey, daddy, crying, babes. Way back, babe. Way, way, in the more sin foggy days. Ooh, I thought I was happy then. All right, our next fact about John Fahey. Fact number two involves a little bit of a, well, religious conversion. One that I think you guitar geeks would resonate with. In fact, Fahey was attracted to record collecting, much like, well, I'm assuming you are, and I certainly am. Uh, Fahey discovered his love of early blues upon hearing Blind Willie Johnson's Praise God, I'm Satisfied, on a record-collecting trip to Baltimore with his friend and mentor, the musicologist Richard K. Spotswood. Much later, Fahey compared the experience to a religious conversion. Now, upon some further reading about this moment in Fahey's life, I would encourage you all to listen to Blind Willie Johnson's Praise God, I'm Satisfied. Because, uh, for copyright reasons, I can't include it on today's show. However, it is impactful in a major way major way. I listened to it doing research and I was like, wow. And then I read a little bit more about John Fahey's experience and it turns out that when um, Richard Spotswood first put this record on for Fahey to listen to in old 78, Fahey didn't like it at all. In fact, he told him to turn it off. And then later on, he said, can you please put that back on? And apparently Fahey was almost brought to tears by this song. And I think once you'll listen to it, which I'll include at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132, once you listen to it, you might be moved in such in that way as well. So uh, very interesting first uh, uh, exposure to the blues for John Fahey. Now our next fact, fact number three, involves the birth of a record label and is very much tied to your trivia question, so make sure to listen up. In 1959, Fahey recorded material that would become his first record for the Tacoma label. He actually recorded it in a church. Having no idea how to approach professional record companies and being convinced that they would be uninterested in his music, Fahey decided to issue his first album himself using some cash he saved from his gas station attendant job. Thus was born Tacoma Records. 100 copies of his first album were pressed. On one side of the sleeve was the name John Fahey. On the other was Blind Joe Death, a humorous nickname given to him by his fellow blues fans. He attempted to sell these albums himself. Some he gave away, some he snuck into thrift stores and blues sections of local record shops, and some he sent to folk music scholars, a few of whom were fooled into thinking that there really was a living old blues singer called Blind Joe Death. It took three years for Fahey to sell the remainder of his records. Two things on this fact, I just have to say. Number one, kudos to John Fahey for creating a myth and actually creating an alter ego that people believe actually existed. And if you look at his first album, the liner notes, you read this and you're left with thinking that Blind Joe Death exists. But Blind Joe Death was John Fahey and John Fahey was Blind Joe Death. So cool. Uh, the second thing is you think of this fact and it's all, oh, it's interesting, it's cool, but this is 1959. John Fahey was well ahead of his time. Nowadays, we know our fellow guitar geeks might be recording things. May, they may be releasing their own albums, but that was nearly unheard of in 1959. And here John Fahey was kind of leading the DIY movement, the kind of, um, we can call it home recording for lack of a better term, and actually pressing his own album because he didn't want to deal with trying to get on a record label. So, well, he created his own. Uh, pretty stunning and pretty awesome when you really put it into that perspective. 
our next fact. Fact number four I've entitled, Masters with some canned heat. Now you might be thinking, Tone, what the hell does that even mean? Well, let me explain, because this is where interesting musical paths converge. And I have a wonderful snippet from a very rare video outtake of a John Fahey performance. We'll get to that in a second. But here's your fact. Fahey received his Master's of Arts in Folklore in 1966. Who was his master's thesis on? Well, Fahey's master thesis was on the music of Charlie Patton. And it was actually later published in 1970 by Studio Vista. He completed it with the musicological assistance of his friend, Alan Wilson. Who the hell is Alan Wilson, you might ask? Well, he would go on to create the band, or be in the band, Canned Heat. In fact, he was the high singer. When you think of their song, uh, Going Up the Country, he was the fella that sang it. Uh, new fact to me, and maybe some of you, that's a new fact as well. Now, one of the cool things I found when researching this show was some video footage from a 1981 house concert in Santa Monica. Apparently, this was footage that was originally slated to make the MTV network, but it never came to light. The show was never produced, etc. but it's actually available for free. In fact, there's a link at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. You can check out this whole 25 minute clip and it's him just playing and talking. And in watching this clip, I found a section where he talks about Charlie Patton. And you can tell he's not only extremely knowledgeable about Charlie Patton, but he even tries to imitate his style and proceeds to, well, I'll, I'll just let John tell you what he told the crowd. Here he is. Oh, I know it be, might be fun. Um, <clears throat> these, guys, these guys I was talking about, like Charlie Patton, I don't know how in the world they do it, but you know, I could, and I can't do it, but, uh, like, they did these crazy things, like, they play the guitar, and, of course, all this time they're singing, too, right? you know, um, and they'd be banging, using guitar as a percussion instrument at the same time. Mr. Like I said, I can't do it. Fingernail, fingernails there, it ought to work. I found this footage to be incredibly inspirational, and I want to encourage all of you guitar geeks who are interested to please visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132 to get the link to that full 25 minute clip. It's it's just, it's almost like you're just hanging out with John Fahey. He, he's, he's playing songs, but then he's also talking in between, and it's like, I don't know, I, I you know, Colorado Kyle and I were practicing for the show, and and uh, immediately I, I said to him, I'm like, I would love to hang out with him. I would love to just be in that room and be able to hear his stories and just kind of absorb his knowledge or whatever whatever I could. And that, that video footage really is about as close as I'm ever gonna come. So I would encourage you uh, to check it out as well. It's just, um, it's extremely guitar geeky, uh, very high level guitar geeky. Let's move on to fact number five. And I've entitled this, Paying It Forward. And I think it's gonna involve a guitar geek that, well, you're very familiar with. In fact, you may very well have drawn inspiration from this guitar geek. In addition to his own creative output, Fahey expanded the Tacoma label, discovering fellow guitarists Leo Kotke, Robbie Basho, Bolasete, and Peter Lang. Kotke's debut release on the label, Six and 12 String Guitar, ultimately proved to be the most successful of the crop selling more than 500,000 copies. And for a small record label, that was, that, that's absolutely enormous. Now, Leo Kaki is very much in touch with how John Fahey has impacted his life. In fact, at a concert, somebody was taking footage and I found this, this wonderful intro to a song where he publicly makes a statement about John Fahey. And well, I'll just go ahead and let Leo Kaki make the statement. Here he is. 
I owe my whole adult life to uh, John Fahey, who had a... He's a good friend, and, uh, and he's the guy that synthesized uh, all these strains from parlor guitar to Charles Ives, and came up with a place that everybody already knew, but, but John had to put it together. This is a tune that he wrote, he denied that he wrote it. That's the kind of guy he was. I just made a connection that I didn't make before, but I have to say it because, well, we're talking about John Fahey. And if you're playing a drinking game where I say John Fahey and you take a drink, by now you are actually in a coma. And I apologize if you embarked on that journey. I hope you didn't for health reasons. But if you did, uh, I, I accept no responsibility. I am not liable for that. Anyways, here's the cool thing. In that footage that I was referencing before of John Fahey in 81 at that Santa Monica house party, he actually plays the last steam engine train. That's the very song Leo Kotke just introduced. To hear those two play it, you hear Kotke's version, you hear Fahey's version, and it's so cool how one song can take a guitarist in so many different directions. Um, just an interesting little, uh, well, just a little factoidal nugget. Yeah, factoidal nugget. That's not an astronomy thing. That's a guitar geek thing. And we're going to coin that term right now. Yes, factoidal nugget. You got five more coming up. But if you need to review any of these factoidal nuggets, please visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. I've mentioned a lot of videos. I've mentioned a lot of songs. There's links to all of them at that very URL that I just mentioned. So make sure to visit that if you are a John Fahey fanatic or if you're just dipping your toe into the John Fahey water. Let's not let's not expand on that statement. I just it was metaphorical. It wasn't it was not literal. There is no John Fahey water that I know of. Uh, anyway, speaking of water, when water freezes, it turns to ice, and when it comes from the sky, it's called snow. And I want to go back to episode 130 and review some comments, which uh, was originally meant to be a bar chord episode, but somehow I'm now gonna just title it the snowplow episode. Uh, you all certainly had a lot to say about me purchasing a snowplow versus actually shoveling my driveway. So let's review some of those comments right now. We're not gonna start there though. We're gonna start with, we're gonna stay on the guitar geek train. Our first comment comes from Alan Keller, and he says this, Tony, am I tripping or what? The Don Ross album cover, 1234, you show on this episode is the same cover used by Callum Graham as shown on Acoustic Tuesday, episode 55. What gives? Love the show, love tack. Watching from Rostovan Don Russia. Peace. Check this out. The album 1234 is a duo album with Callum Graham and Don Ross. Hence the same album cover, and it's super guitar geeky because it's wood, it's mahogany, I believe, or rosewood, inlaid with abalone, the numbers one, two, colon, three, four. Uh, pretty awesome album to boot. So thank you for commenting, Alan, and thank you for pointing that out. Our next comment is a little bit of a twofer. Yes, Buck Wicker and Tanya Lewis had some things to say about my snowplow situation. Uh, Buck Wicker says this, about the guitar fund or four-wheeler with a plow decision, remember, happy wife, happy life to which Tanya said, Whitney is right about this one. In fact, the majority of the support went into Whitney's corner, so I do believe a four-wheeler with a plow is in our future. However, um, we're nearing the end of winter, so I'm thinking if I just wait, if I hang on a little bit longer, if I keep shoveling, I'll be able to get a four-wheeler with a plow at a, at a raving steel. Uh, in fact, of all the 95 comments to date uh, on the show, I wanna say about 65% of them were in favor of the snowplow with only very few supporting me continually shoveling. So I think there, you know, I think you, you all have clearly spoken and you know, you all take direction from me every Tuesday. So I think I should start taking some direction from you. I think I'm gonna make Whitney happy and uh, get ourselves a four-wheeler with the plow. Sounds fun. And there was also some entrepreneurial comments about me maybe starting my own snowplow business, saving time, and then that would create more money for guitar purchasing power. I mean, you guys are pretty, pretty awesome. I really appreciate you all. <laughs> Our next comment, speaking of John Fahey, comes from Lafayette Le Saint. 
And they say this, Hey Tony, enjoyed your show. You mentioned John Fahey brought back a good memory. I remember when I got my first guitar, a Stella Harmony, second worst guitar in the world. I, I'd be curious to know what the first is. I didn't know how to play and was happy to discover Laura Weber folk guitar here in Phoenix on our local PBS channel. On one of her shows, she had John Fahey as a guest. I was impressed not only by his unique music and playing, but also by his persona. John was not a slick and polished performer. This was evidenced by the beer bottle sitting, ne sitting on the floor next to him while he sat smoking and his I don't care attitude. His attitude came to my attention when he nonchalantly dumped his cigarette ashes into his guitar. Laura told him that he shouldn't do that. He replied, this is not an exact quote, that it wasn't a big deal for it was just an old guitar. Laura Weber was also an inspiration to me in her own right. She taught me my first blues strum. She was a great teacher. However, what really encouraged me what, real, what really encouraged me about her was my mother hated her singing. I thought that if someone my mother deemed horrible could be on TV, then there was hope for me. Uh, awesome guitar geek journey story and also a great story to John Fahey. And I think one of the things, and I'll just kind of hop on your comment here. One of the things that really fascinates me about John Fahey is yes, his playing, his approach to guitar, but also it is his persona. Uh, an incredible creative and somebody who really, they, John had a lot of ups and downs in his life uh, between alcohol and uh, marriages and all sorts of different travels and things, um, health problems, what have you. But, you know, his creative output was incredible. Uh, and we're actually going to get to that in some upcoming facts, um, some surprising creative output, actually. But, um, yeah, I think I think it's, it's definitely 50-50 for me. It's the guitar and the persona put together in the John Fahey package that uh, absolutely just, I just absolutely love. Our final comment comes from Charlene Kerr. She says this, Hey Tony, I was just looking at Riversong Guitar's website from British Columbia. They are doing some really interesting things with the fretboard and bracing. Have you had a chance to review them yet? It'd be really, I'd be really interested, especially since they are in a pretty economical price range. Well, Charlene, I'm happy to say that um, I have something in the works. I've reached out to Rainsong, rather Rainsong has reached out to me, and I'm hoping that uh, in the mailbag here soon, uh, we'll see a Rainsong guitar. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure about this one. I'm about 85% sure. So thank you for the comment. And thank you everybody uh, for your comments on episode 130. It was a great show. Uh, we featured a Boucher Dread. In fact, Tim K was saying how much he loves his Boucher guitars. And he was saying, man, so lucky you get to spend time with such an awesome guitar. Uh, so thank you to everybody who mentioned um, well, who just stopped in and commented on the show and participated in the discussion. The overwhelming uh, snowplow reinforcement. Uh, Whitney, thank you. I'll thank you for Whitney. Um, again, I think happy wife, happy life was um, maybe quoted 38 times in the comments. So I get the idea. You know, it's, I'm, I'm coming into my second year of marriage. I'm really, I'm really dialing everything in, or so I think anyway. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I have an interesting story to share with you all. Uh, certainly not a comment from the show, but one that I wanted to share with you because I was just in Milwaukee uh, this past weekend catching a Milwaukee Admirals hockey game with my son, uh, Whitney, my parents, and my brother, and his son, and it was just awesome. It was a great family weekend. Um, it was cool to see some AHL hockey. I just, I love watching a good hockey game, but I digress. This story is not about hockey. It's actually about being careful in elevators. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I went to this hockey game. It was great. We were on the parking garage. We were on like the eighth floor. We hop in the elevator, a bunch of people cram in. We were packed in like sardines. And we get to the sixth floor and the elevator just stops. Well, what I thought was the sixth floor was actually in between the sixth and seventh floor. Yes, the elevator got stuck. We were stuck in there for 30 minutes. Uh, we called 911, we got out. We had to climb an, a ladder out of the elevator. It was something I never thought I'd find myself, a position I never thought I'd find myself in. Um, but nonetheless, a huge thanks to the Milwaukee uh, Fire Department for uh, saving our butts. It was getting pretty hot in that elevator. Kudos, Milwaukee Fire Department. You guys rock. And you were pretty funny and really nice at that. So, so thanks. It was a good sturdy ladder too. Elevator, not so much. Uh, by the way, I do want to mention you can support the Acoustic Tuesday show, non-elevator related. If you visit AcousticTuesday.store, 
Go ahead and go there, pick out your favorite piece of gear. It could be a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, a coffee mug, a pair of socks, whatever. Whatever gets your goat or suits your fancy or you know one of those other one-liners. Go ahead and order it. When you get it, step two is to go ahead and take a picture with you and your Acoustic Tuesday merchandise on. This could be you on vacation, you with your guitars, you with your family, you just hanging out. Maybe it's a coffee cup on a tape, a coffee cup on a table. I would take that picture as well. And the last step is to submit it at acousticlife.tv. When you go to that website, there's a uh, submit link in the top menu. Click on it. You can upload your picture, tell us your story, and I'll feature you on an upcoming episode of Acoustic Tuesday. And you know what? You might be randomly selected to win some Santa Cruz parabolic tension strings. So, you know, what do you got to lose? You get a cool shirt, you submit your picture, you might get some strings. It, it seems like a guitar geek win, 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 win. So please go ahead and do that. Again, that's AcousticTuesday.store. All right, let's let's carry on the Fahey Fact Freight Train. Yeah, I, I had to alliterate that because it just felt good. Uh, let's move to our next fact, fact number six. And this involves Fahey and another record label that he started. Check this out. After the death of his father in 1995, Fahey used his inheritance to form another record label, Revenant Records. And he actually released his own uh, music on this, an album entitled Red Cross. And a quick aside from the fact, this is an album that you all should get either on CD or vinyl purely for the packaging. The music is cool as well. It's a little bit of a detour from Fahey's uh, traditional acoustic stuff. But I digress, uh, between the liner notes and the packaging, this is an awesome example of how much of a, a visceral experience that opening a record or physical music can actually be. It's a great example, so please check that out. Now, Revenant Records, uh, the original focus was to reissue obscure recordings of early blues, old time music, and anything else that really took John Fahey's fancy. The label's most famous release would prove to be Screamin' and Holler in the Blues, The Worlds of Charlie Patton, which was a seven disc retrospective of Charlie Patton and his contemporaries. It won three Grammy Awards in 2003, and if I have my facts straight, this is the very record or compilation of songs that uh, Revenant Records and Third Man Records actually worked in conjunction to release again on Third Man, Third, Third Man Records with some really awesome packaging as well. So if you're a Charlie Patton fan, if you're a blues fan, if you're an early blues fan, make sure to check that out. It certainly was Grammy worthy uh, and certainly worthy of our guitar geek ears. Our next fact, fact number seven, I've entitled Award Winner. Now, you don't usually associate American primitive guitar with awards, but John Fahey won a Grammy. Check this out. Fahey, for his part, won a Grammy in 1997 for his contributions to the liner notes of Revenant's Anthology of American Folk Music, Volume 4. And if you check out this album, flip it over and read the little excerpt on the back, and I think you'll immediately realize Whoa, there's some powerful writing here. And if you don't normally associate John Fahey with writing, because he's primarily an instrumentalist, um, I wanna bring two books to your attention. First, uh, a wonderfully titled book, How Bluegrass Music Destroyed My Life. Uh, this is a book of stories written by John Fahey, and I also wanna mention Vampire Vultures, also a book of original stories by John Fahey. And what I love about these two books is they're kind of a combination of, well, if you like, Jack Kerouac and kind of the beat poet kind of uh, vibe. These are, these kind of toe that line between autobiographical and fiction. And it's really neat to know that John Fahey, although these are stories, are probably things that may very well have happened to him. Um, so I'm not necessarily comparing John Fahey to Jack Kerouac. I think the approach is similar. That's that's the point I'm trying to make there. Um, and of course, I'll link to those at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. In fact, uh, while we're talking books, I also want to mention uh, Dance of Death, The Life of John Fahey, writ written by Steve Lowenthal, a great uh, biography about John Fahey, his life, and his entire guitar journey. Uh, pretty inexpensive book. I think I paid about seven bucks for it, um, and just an absolute delight to read. So make sure to check that out as well. I have another book, but it's related to another fact, uh, which, well, it's coming up, so I may as well just dive right into it. Uh, fact number eight, I've entitled New Inspiration. Fahey began to channel a new outlet for experimentation, which included his return to painting. 
a hobby he abandoned when he took up the guitar. He painted on found poster board and discarded spiral notebook paper. His painting studio floated from motel bed to motel bed and eventually ended up on the bed of his rental home in Salem, Oregon. Occasionally painting with antifreeze in his garage, he worked with tempera, acrylic, spray paint, and magic marker amongst many other mediums. Now, uh, I mentioned another book and I wanna call this one to your attention. John Fahey Paintings. This is a great coffee table book for any guitar geek room, any guitar geek den. It's a conversation starter, but more importantly, something that took me by surprise is that the cover emulates uh, the back of a spiral bound notebook. Actually, the back does as well. Um, so I thought this was a great fitting tribute to John Fahey's visual art as well. And in the back, I'm not gonna show you the pictures because I wanna encourage you to get the book and I'll link to it at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. Uh, in the back, there's some pictures taken of his, well, I'll call it painting toolboxes where you can see some of his, um, well, medium that he uses, spray paint and some other non-conventional things. So a book very worth, uh, very worth your time and certainly, as I mentioned, a conversation starter. Now for you guitar geeks out there, which I'm assuming all of you are, you're watching the Acoustic Tuesday show, the welcome home to all guitar geeks. Yes, we're moving on to fact number nine, which focuses on John Fahey's gear. Some interesting revelations I am about to reveal. Check this out. Now, John Fahey was not known to play fancy instruments. In fact, he tended to pick up inexpensive guitars and then pawn them when he needed cash, especially later in his career. During his heyday in the late 60s and early 70s, Fahey was partial to a 1930s Gibson Recording King with a sunburst top and a bell-like tone. He used it to record some of his most enduring albums, including America, Of Rivers and Religion, After the Ball, and Fair Forward Voyagers. Now, this particular guitar is a Recording King, I believe it's a Keith Whitley model. Uh, and I don't think it's all that common. So you might be thinking, I'd love to conjure up John Fahey's tone, but how do I do such thing without being, being able to access that very guitar? Well, let me introduce to you Tony Klassen of New Era Guitars, and he's actually building a reproduction model of this very guitar. Tony Klassen is a huge Fahey fan. He plays John Fahey songs so very well, and he also makes these guitars inspired by the guitar that, well, inspired John Fahey. And here Tony is playing his model of the Recording King Keith Whitley model. guitar that is full of mojo, but that's not the only guitar John Fahey is associated with. He's also associated with an extremely rare instrument built by the Bacon and Day Banjo Company. Check this out. The Bacon and Day Banjo Company made a few guitars they called Senorita. No one seems to know how many were actually made. This was maybe during the 40s. Uh, the Senoritas were a bit different. They had one that was very elaborate with stones and inlays and even color, and one that was plainer. They were bigger than a parlor size, but not as big as a dreadnought size, and they issued this very distinct, almost barky tone. And we are lucky enough to have footage of John Fahey playing this very guitar. Here he is playing that Bacon and Day Senorita, playing the song Red Pony. Again, you're thinking tone. You just told me about an extremely rare guitar. I'd love to get my hands on one, but clearly that, that the odds of that are slim. So let me reintroduce you to Tony Klassen. Again, Tony Klassen of New Era Guitars is actually building a reproduction model of the Bacon and Day Senorita. And it's of course inspired by John Fahey. And I was looking for footage because I wanted to hear this guitar. I wanted to see this guitar. Who did I find playing it? None other than Stefan Grossman, who we just featured on Acoustic Tuesday. Here he is playing the new era, kind of bacon and day Senorita model. Check it out.
random factoidal nugget, I'm just gonna pull this from my brain, check this out. So, John Fahey wrote a tune called The Assassination of Stefan Grossman. Stefan Grossman wrote a tune called The Assassination of John Fahey. There's Stefan Grossman playing a guitar that John Fahey made famous. I mean, does it get any cooler than that? It's like this, what is it, the six degrees of separation of Kevin, ba six degrees of Kevin Bacon or something like that? Something about bacon? Love bacon, it's one of my favorite food groups. Uh, anyways, let's move right on to our final fact. Fact number 10, I've entitled Gone But Not Forgotten. And I think this episode is certainly a testament to this very fact. In February of 2001, six days before his 62nd birthday, Fahey died at Salem Hospital after undergoing a sextuple coronary bypass. In 2006, no fewer than four Fahey tribute albums were released as a testament to his reputation as a giant of 20th century American music. Now, I'm not gonna go through each of these tribute albums. In fact, this was taken uh, from information right around 2006. There's a ton of tribute albums out there. In fact, I would encourage you to dig into some because not only will you hear John Fahey's music from a little bit different perspective, you're also gonna discover new artists. And um, wow, it's just amazing to really look at this lineage and say, John Fahey, you know, here he was inspired. He bought a $17 Sears and Roebuck guitar. Fast forward to the end of his life. He literally inspired an entire generation, an entire genre of music. Uh, so whether or not, you know, that's why I don't like to touch on the health problems, the marital problems, and all this other stuff, because John Fahey's contri contribution to acoustic guitar and American primitive guitar is something that will continue to live on. I'm very confident of that. In fact, um, each, each and every time I mention John Fahey, somebody either hasn't heard of him or somebody either has. And it's this cool opportunity to share a guitar geek moment, moment with those that have, but also those that haven't. You really unlock an entire door to a whole new genre of music that, that really needs to continue to push forward. In fact, that brings me to our final segment. I gotta get back to my American Primitive Guitarist countdown. Uh, before we do that, let me visit the mailbag. Actually, you've seen uh, all the arrivals of the mailbag. All the books that I mentioned, the John Fahey paintings, Dance of Death, the John Fahey's Life, uh, Vampire Vultures, and How Bluegrass Music Destroyed My Life are all books that any John Fahey fan should own. And in fact, I wanna mention also, there's a box set out called The Transcendental Water Waterfall. I, I have it at home, I don't have it here. It was snowing, I didn't wanna get it wet. I'm a, I'm a dork, I'm a record dork, and I just didn't wanna devalue it. Not that it's super valuable. Anyways, the, the record collection is called The Transcendental Transcendental Waterfall. And it's a collection, I believe, of his first five or six albums. Uh, it comes with a t-shirt and it comes with full liner notes, um, photocopied liner notes of his, of his first album. It's awesome. It's like diving into John Fahey's brain and it's so worth your time. I'll include a link to that as well at acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. Without further ado, let's round out the top five American primitive guitarists that are carrying forward John Fahey's legacy. And we're gonna visit number five. Yes, it's Daniel Bachman. We featured Daniel on Acoustic Tuesday before. He plays acoustic slide guitar, he plays a six string, he plays a 12 string, and he does so in a way that encapsulates all things American primitive guitar. In fact, uh, there's some really cool experimental stuff that he's done with kind of just, I'm talking like 16 minute long tracks that have these cool sounds and bells. And it's, it's very, um, well, I'll call it, it puts you in a very zen-like state. In fact, it's another one of those albums you can just sit down and listen to and become just infatuated with. Uh, we're gonna listen to a song off of his self-titled album. Great album art on this, by the way. This song is entitled, The Flower Tree.
playing, uh, I believe it's a 70s, late 60s, early 70s uh, Martin D28 in that particular performance, and it sounds it sounds great. Uh, but I digress. His his technique is what I really want you to focus on there. Um, he does this wonderful. He just activates the bass notes. He digs into the bass notes, and it creates this wonderful drone that kind of propels the song forward. Um, just an awesome player to listen to. He's got a full-blown catalog. Make sure to check out his music. Um, uh, he's got another album out, Jesus, I'm a Sinner. That's fantastic. Uh, but I got to move on. We got a countdown. We got, I got more artists to share with you, two of which you, I guarantee you've never heard of. I can't even pronounce one of their names, uh, but I'm going to try my best. Uh, a guitar player number four that I want you to know about that is carrying this American primitive guitar style forward is Nathan Salzberg. Again, I featured Nathan on a past episode of Acoustic Tuesday. It was actually brought to my attention from an Acoustic Tuesday viewer from a sub, uh, submission on the AcousticLife.tv website. Nathan, I will say, of all of the 10 that I've picked, is probably the most refined um, American primitive guitarist, and I say that not in terms of him. It's not a better or worse thing. I'm not. I'm not evaluating like good or bad because I don't really. I don't buy into that. Um, Nathan's approach to guitar really. He has the elements of simple melodies, and he has the elements of finger style, and beautiful dissonance. But he also has this. I'm picking up a little bit of a Celtic vibe from his playing. We're gonna to listen to a song off of his album, Hard For To Win and Can't Be Won, which is a beautiful statement in and of itself. The artwork's gorgeous. The songs are 10 times as gorgeous as the artwork. And here's one of them, First Field Path. song on a beautiful Bourgeois OM there. Shout out to the folks at Bourgeois for making absolutely gorgeous instruments. Uh, let's move on to number three, a guitar player number three, one that was new to me, one that is likely new to you, one that I had to do a lot of digging, even to order his albums. Yes, I had to go on Bandcamp, I listened to the albums, and I was like, I need to own that. I need to own this. How do I order it? I believe he's from the UK, or France. I, I don't, I don't, actually, I don't really know. I gotta be honest. I With all these players, I'm starting to mash together where they're from, and it's getting a little confusing, but nonetheless, I want you to know his name. I'm gonna say this as best I can. Hopefully, I do it accurately. Jan Morgensen. Um, a delightful player, and let me be honest, I discovered Jan because of an album cover. His newest album that was released called Ad Patres, um, a gorgeous album cover featuring a skull. I mean, this. as soon as I saw this album cover, it was striking, and I thought, I don't, I don't even know if I care how the music sounds. I just want this picture in my house, because it's beautiful. Then I listened to the music, and I was like, it's a match made in heaven. You got skulls, American primitive guitar, even though he's not from America. I say American primitive more as a statement for a genre. I guess I could just call it primitive guitar playing. Um, Wow, this is gonna blow you away. Here's a music video uh, done for his song Rotten off of this album. Uh, it's it's gorgeous. It, it's you gotta check it out. Here it is. It's song. I literally lost words. All my descriptors are gone. Colorado Kyle is back here laughing at me because I'm just stumbling trying to describe Jan's music and it's just... <laughs> 
I was like, no, I'm not. He was. He was laughing at me. Um, it's it's so. It's just, it's riveting. I, 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 From the actual aesthetic of the video to the album cover, I've said it enough. Check out Jan Morgensen. Uh, he's on Bandcamp. You can listen to the albums there, or you can listen to the, there's two albums in particular you can listen to there. I recommend ordering them. I did it through PayPal. Uh, hopefully we'll receive those albums soon uh, because I'm just jonesing. I'm jonesing to put them on my turntable. Let's move on to guitar player number two. Primitive guitar player number two. I'm gonna have some problems pronouncing this name. Uh, New Discovery. I looked on Spotify, I dug into his music and noticed he had like 102 monthly listeners and I thought, that's ridiculous, everybody needs to hear him. Uh, whether or not he wants it or not, this music is gorgeous and it is it is primitive guitar to a T. His name, I'm gonna try this, <laughs> try my best here, Yust Dikema, Dikema, Dikema. Uh, I hope I said this correctly. Uh, he plays a J45 Custom, Rosewood back and sides. We're not talking about the guitar, but I'm a guitar geek, so I gotta share those details when I see him. And he does something very interesting with his right hand. I'll reveal that after we see him play. We're gonna listen to a song off of his album, Sacred Revelations, which actually has a, I think it's a Charlie Poole inspired cover, but nonetheless, it's an awesome piece of art. Uh, but here's the song, The Sun Behind the Mountain. Did you see what happened with his picking hand? Did, did anybody see it? First of all, let me say this. It was hard for me to decide how much of the song I was gonna let play because I, I wanted to play the whole thing. But later on in that video, there's a close up of his picking hand. He has a thumb pick on, he's got a, a finger pick on his index finger, his middle finger, his ring finger, and his pinky. He might have them on his toes for all I know, but he's got a finger pick on all of his fingers and he uses them to do this really cool um, roll. It's, it's a, it's, well, it's a five finger roll and it really places such huge emphasis. It's like an exclamation point on the melody. It's, wow, uh, listening to his music is awesome. Uh, Whitney approved, okay? That is Whitney approved. We went from the, the Rob Noyes album to Use album, and she was like, this is, this is better. This is less anxiety producing. Um, I didn't have the same reaction. I wanted to listen to them both. That's a whole nother discussion. Uh, but anyways, check out Use Albums. He's got a couple of them out there. Uh, you can find them on Spotify, and of course, uh, check out those uh, performances, or that performance in full. Just go to acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. Now here we are at the number one primitive guitarist. Now I mentioned before, do you wanna recap? Maybe I should just, do, I'll just quickly name them because it's a celebration of all things John Fahey. It's a celebration of all things primitive guitar. Number 10 was Glenn Jones. Number nine, Jack Rose. Number eight, Nathan Bowles. Number seven, Rob Noyes. Number six, Marissa Anderson, the lone female so far. Number five, Daniel Bachman. Number four, Nathan Salzberg. Number three, Jan Morgensen. Number two, Just Jakema. And number one, Gwenifer Raymond. Yes, we're gonna round out this countdown with another female, Gwenifer Raymond. This was uh, somebody who I wanna say was Andrew D. Again, brought her to my attention. Wow, holy smokes, wow. In fact, when Charlie Parr was in town last time, we went out for coffee and I was asking if he had ever heard of Gwenifer. And he's like, yeah, I did some shows overseas and she opened and she just brought this kind of like, he, I think I want to, I want to quote him accurately. I don't know if I will. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. He, I think he said something about punk rock attitude to the acoustic guitar, and watching her play, and she does it all. By the way, uh, she does like the Weisenborn acoustic slide type thing. She does the banjo uh, extremely well, both of those, and the guitar, of course. Um, she embodies primitive guitar. The attitude, the um, the impact, the exclamation, kind of the the um, kind of like hey. 
this is one guitar, but look what it's capable of. If you can wrap that up into one word, that's the word I'm, I'm looking for. So if you can help me in the comments, let me know. Gwenifer, uh, her compositions are beautiful. Uh, she clearly uh, cites John Fahey as an influence. In fact, I wanna say she has a song, Requiem for John Fahey. Um, which is gorgeous. And you gotta check out her album, uh, You Were Never Much of a Dancer, uh, which I think the album cover is beautiful. It, it contains, you, know, like, you look at John Morganson's album and you look at hers and it's like skulls, taxidermy, the guitar. I mean, what more can you ask for as a guitar geek? Um, so cool, I'm so thankful she's making music and it's just a treat to listen to. Uh, we're gonna l actually listen to her most recent single. It's not on the album You Were Never Much of a Dancer, but I believe it was released as a separate single called The Three Deaths of Red Spectre. Here's Gwenifer. Wow, right? Words don't express. One of the things as a guitar geek and somebody who admires her playing, first of all, I would equate her to a 60s, 70s, <clears throat> excuse me, John Fahey. Um, the speed, the, the, the note selection, and I'm not talking speed like blazing fast, I'm just talking the speed and the, the way that the compositions kind of lay out the note selection, the dissonance, the kind of almost mild uncomfortability that she uh, that she brings, that that kind of you gather from her compositions, but it 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 somehow resolves in its own unique way. Um, it's just gorgeous. But from a guitar geek, somebody who who really appreciates the style, if you watch her thumb, it is like as regular as a machine. It, it's dead on time. It's accurate and it's powerful. Uh, so. Gwenifer, you got a darn good thumb. What can I say? Thumbs up. Uh, <laughs> so that rounds out our top 10, my top 10 American primitive guitarists uh, that are carrying forward John Fahey's legacy. I think these are these are primitive guitarists that John Fahey would certainly approve of, would certainly admire, and would certainly um, also give a thumbs up if he were still with us today. Now, one of the things I do wanna ask you, this is a huge favor that I wanna ask of you guitar geeks watching the show right now. I need you to answer the question, did I miss anybody? Is there somebody that you know of that needs to be on this list that I just simply forgot or don't know about yet? Or that maybe all of us guitar geeks need to know about? If that's the case in the comments below, please let me know, let all of us know if there's a primitive guitarist that you think needs to be on this countdown that I may have missed. I'll go ahead and put their name, you can put a link to their YouTube clip, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, leave it in the comments below because I think collectively we can compile this wonderful guitar geek submission list here in the comments that will even go well beyond just 10 players. So uh, thank you all for, for checking out these, these players, but also for contributing in the comments. I guess it's an advanced thanks, but I'm assuming you'll do that if I missed any players. And again, to get the full list, uh, to purchase the albums, to get the books, to check out the John Fahey factoids, please do visit acousticlife.tv forward slash AT132. They'll all be there, and uh, it'll, it'll be kind of a, a John Fahey slash primitive guitar uh, resource for all of us. Uh, now, oh my gosh, the factoidal nugget rainstorm continues. It's almost like a factoidal asteroid meteor storm that we're in right now. I gotta wrap up Guitar Geek trivia. So if in case you forgot the question, let me go ahead and remind you because it's been quite a while and a lot of information has been thrown your way. John Fahey, as we now know, started the record label Tacoma Records in the year 1959 to release his own music. Tacoma eventually released more than just John's music. What was the first non-Fahey record to be released on this label? Was it Leo Kotke's 6 and 12 string guitar, Book of White's Mississippi Blues, Peter Lang's The Thing at the Nursery Room Window, or Mike Aldridge's Dobro? If you answered B, Book of White's Mississippi Blues, you are 100% correct. Book of White's album, Mississippi Blues, was released on Tacoma Records in 1964. Fahey decided to track down blues legend Book of White by sending a postcard to Aberdeen, Mississippi. 
because White had sung that Aberdeen was his hometown, and Mississippi John Hurt had been rediscovered using a similar method. When White responded, Fahey and Ed Denson, who actually helped him start Tacoma Records, decided to travel to Memphis and record White. Those very recordings became the first non-Fahey Tacoma release. It's a beautiful album. Again, I would recommend everybody get it. Um, and how cool that not only did Fahey and Denson record Book of White, they actually rediscovered him by sending a simple postcard in the 60s. Now, just in case you're curious, uh, Book of White's album, Mississippi Blues, came out in 64. Leo Kotke's 6 and 12 string guitar, the most successful Tacoma release, selling over 500,000 copies, came out in 74. Uh, Peter Lang's The Thing at the Nursery Room Window came out in 73. And Mike Aldridge's Dobro came out in 72. I have all those on vinyl. No big deal. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's just a humble brag. Uh, they're all great albums, so I would I would encourage you to rec uh, to add those to your record collection if you ever get the opportunity. Uh, all right, well, holy smokes, that wraps up our John Fahey tour day force. But we do have one more important item of business, and that is taking a sneak peek into next week. And I simply wrote on my notes, it's going to be a battle for the ages. Two guitars, both named after battleships, ten numbers apart going against each other head to head. Yes, it's gonna be D28 versus D18. Which one's better? I don't know, you're gonna to have to tune in next week to find out. Remember, you can watch Acoustic Tuesday every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time here on YouTube. For your Acoustic Tuesday fix in between Tuesdays, please visit AcousticLife.tv. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time with me today. I cannot thank you enough for being a guitar geek, and I cannot thank you enough for now being an incredibly knowledgeable John Fahey fan. Let's keep this primitive guitar genre alive. Let's keep sharing it with other guitar geeks. And remember, when we do that, guitar geeks unite. Thank you so much for watching today, and I'll see you next Tuesday on Acoustic Tuesday. Cheers.